Hey everyone, Grandmaster Ben Feingold here. I'm giving this a second try. I actually made this video yesterday and posted it. And then I was sitting outside, it was sort of nice. Um, but I was actually sitting like in the sun, so you would get like a better view of me or something, I don't know. And actually it got really hot. And when I stopped, my phone and my computer were really hot. And at the end of the video, of the last minute, it was just really choppy because the computer wasn't working so good. So I, I had to take the video down because at the last minute, you can't understand what I'm saying. Um, okay, so I just make the video again. Um, this is the game uh, Vessel and Topol of Wesley So from the London Chess Classic last year. Um, I think it's in December. So it was played about five months ago. Um, and uh, So won the London Chess Classic, as you know, and he won the Grand Chess Tour. I think actually he basically won the Grand Chess Tour before the London Chess Classic. But I guess there was a, there was a very small outside chance that he could not win it. But I mean, he would have to come in last, I think, and Hikaru come in first. Some weird thing. Anyway, um, so it was a, Wesley was still on his big run of winning tournaments. Um, he won the Sinkfield Cup. He won the London Chess Classic. He won Tata Steel. Uh, he won the U.S. Championship. Um, and then the last tournament he played, and he tied for second. He actually lost uh, to Mamajarov, breaking a big streak of 67 games of not losing. Um, currently... There's a big streak going of Gata Um I actually didn't look at his game today, so everything I could be telling you is a lie. But uh, God has played 26 consecutive games without losing over the last um, basically month and a half. He, he's just playing nonstop. So in the last uh, five rounds of the U.S. Championship, Gata didn't lose. And then Komsky went to the Granke Open, and he didn't lose. He got seven out of nine. Then he went to Reykjavik and did not lose and got 8 out of 10. Although I think one of his opponents wasn't FIDE rated because when I looked at the FIDE list, they only list nine rated games for him. So I don't know if one of his opponents wasn't rated. Then he played in Bundesliga and he beat some lower rated GM, somebody like a little higher than me, I guess. And currently he's playing in the Russian Team Championship. He drew the first round uh, three days ago against the Pomniashi uh, in 106 moves. And Gata was down a piece in the end game the whole game, but he, he drew anyway. And then he drew yesterday against um, a GM who's slightly higher rated than me. And then I guess he played today, but I don't know what happened. So he had 12 wins and 14 draws in this period. Um, and he's going to turn 43 next month. So there's a lot of big streaks going on in chess. And they're not just drawing streaks, um, or in my case, losing streaks. There's Wesley So having his big streak and then finally lost a game um, and he's started a new streak since. He's his eight game streak, which isn't very long. Uh, and God is on a 26 game streak of not losing, which is for somebody under 2,700 who's over the age of you know 40. You know, and not only that, but more impressive is God is just traveling everywhere. He's playing all over the world and basically not taking any breaks and still not losing, which is really impressive. Okay, so Topolov and Wesley are actually the same kind of player. They both like to have active positions and play aggressively, and I think that's why Wesley won this game. Um, Veselin played bishop c4, and I don't think um, this is Veselin's kind of position. I think he likes active, interesting, exchange sacrifice, attacking chess, and this isn't that interesting. Um, it's more of a maneuvering kind of game, and it's, I mean, let's face it, this is sort of boring. Now, bishop g5 is interesting because he pins the knight right away, and I think the idea of playing c3, a4, bishop g5 isn't very common. Um, I think we're going to find out why. Probably it's better just to leave the bishop alone on, on c1. And I think nowadays, when I say nowadays, this game was played five months ago, but I think it's more common now that a lot of people at the top level are trading all these bishops. White's playing bishop e3 at some point, and black's playing bishop e6 at some point. And the reason is these bishops can become real monsters, and I think um, those bishops are so strong that people just are trading them. Now, Wesley did something really interesting in this position. Uh, he played g5, and we often will see g5 in the double king pawn openings when black's castle and queen side, and then he's going to play h5 and, you know, play for a big attack. But Wesley played a surprising move to me. He, he castled king side. Um, 
And he's just saying that even though I've played g5, you can't really attack my king, um, but your bishop on g3 is trapped. So even though the computer prefers white here, I actually prefer black. And the reason is I really like Wesley's bishop here, and I don't like um, top loss bishop on g3. And also, when I play black and Rui Lopez, um, as you've seen from my previous videos, I play knight f6 and bishop c5. So I'm used to having this, this nice bishop on the diagonal. Okay, and top of all castled. And knight h7 was played. Knight h7 is a really unusual move. Um, and I think this is why Wesley's so good. I think in sharp positions where it's unbalanced, there's nobody better. And I know that most of you who watch my videos and most of my fellow grandmasters, they think that Magnus is better than Wesley. But even though, like for example, when I did commentary with Eric Hansen, you know, he's a big Magnus fan, of course, um, and uh, he thinks it's not even close, that Magnus is obviously better than Wesley. But he agreed that in positions that are very sharp, where it's important to calculate correctly or maybe mess the game up and make it interesting, that Wesley's better than Magnus. And maybe in technical positions where you have a slight advantage, then Magnus is better. Um, and that's that's fair. Obviously, nobody's better in every position. But this knight h7 seems like a real Wesley move. He wants to play h5, so he's defending his g-pawn. And also, uh, later in the game, he might want to play f5. Okay. And if somehow the f-file gets open without playing f5, because the f-file open is pretty impressive, um, if we play like bishop to e6 and trade the bishops, okay, black playing knight h7 means that the rook on f8 is... A little more active. Okay, so h3, so Veselin can escape with his bishop on h2 if necessary, or possibly play knight h2, controlling g4. h3 is fine. h5, and he plays d4. And as you all know at home, when somebody attacks on the flank, you counterattack in the center. And again, I prefer black's position. I understand what black's trying to do, uh, but the engine still likes white. Okay, e takes d4, which um, the engine likes. Knight takes d4. Now there's a discovered attack on the on the h5 pawn. And g4. And um, g4 is sort of a hard move to play because I think when you play h5, you want to play h4. And now h4 isn't as good because the bishop has h2 and the pawns can't keep rolling. Um, so I think actually g4 makes more sense now that white's played h3. Um, and of course, if I get to move again, maybe I can play knight g5 later, taking on h3 or not. Um, so g4 actually makes a lot of sense. Okay, he took on g4, took on g4. And now in my opinion, uh, the opening of the h-file favors black. I think if somebody is going to double on the h-file with a queen and a rook, it's going to be black. I don't see how... White gets his queen or rook on the h file, but I do see how black does it. Black plays king g7, rook h8, moves his queen to the h file. And normally, uh, in this kind of pawn structure, in this kind of opening, this is really dangerous when the h file is open because you can get in trouble here. Black gets in less trouble, even though white has the same kind of thing going, because he can play king g7. And it's, it's illegal to move white's king, you know, to f1 or g2. So... The white king is basically staying on g1, opposite this bishop on a7, and you're not moving your king to the h file. You don't want to. So the fact that white black's king can move off of the diagonal and white's can't it helps black. Okay, once again, the computer says white's doing great. Knight takes c6, which messes up black's pawn structure. Um, and black was threatening just to win a pawn on d4, so... Okay, and then e5, which computer also likes. Um, again, attacking in the center, d5. And now, um, I know I'm a grandmaster and all, and I have engines, and I've analyzed games, and I've played a lot of chess, um, but I don't necessarily understand what the computer is saying now. Um, I guess I'll talk to a better player than myself at some point and ask what they're talking about. But here, the engine really hates the move uh, a bishop e2, which is what Topolov played. 
it wants the bishop to retreat on the other diagonal, on the on the a2, g8 diagonal, or a2 or b3. And after bishop a2 or b3, it says that white's better. And after bishop e2, it says white's much worse. To me, bishop e2, what Topolov played, is more natural. The bishop doesn't seem very good on a2 with the black pawn on d5 and the black pawn on c6. Bishop on e2 is putting pressure on g4. So I don't know. I'm not sure why bishop e2 is so bad, but the computer really likes black in that position. So I like black irrespective. And just, I don't want to belabor the point about how strong Wesley is, but I think in these kinds of positions that are double-edged and uh, attacking and the pawn structure is dissimilar, Wesley's the best player in the world. And I think in more um, sterile positions where one side's a tiny bit better, then you'd pick Magnus. And I wouldn't, I just wouldn't, if I could have somebody play black here, it wouldn't be Magnus. I probably would pick other people other than Wesley to play black here. Um, probably I'd rather have Aronian play black here than Magnus, because that just seems like the kind of position that Aronian or Wesley So, or I could name some other strong players, would, would do well with black. In fact, <laughs> probably number two after So would be Topolov, but Topolov's white. And I told this long, boring story in, in the last time I made this video, which got deleted. Um, there's two players in Michigan, I'm, I'm from Michigan originally, who were over 2,100, Bob Schifoni, who's known as a poker player, and John Brooks. John Brooks is a very aggressive player with either color and plays instantly. He plays blitz chess when he's playing in slow tournaments. Bob Schifoni is the opposite. He's a boring player, positional player, strategic player, and plays really slowly and knows a ton of theory. And the range are about the same. When they play each other, Bob turns into somebody else. Bob knows that John Brooks likes to play aggressive attacking chess and make positions like this happen. Um, and when he's playing John Brooks, he decided a long time ago he's going to play super aggressive and make lots of threats and not play positionally soundly necessarily. And he said, his, he said John doesn't like that. He likes to be on that side of it, not on the defending side. And I think it's the same here. I think Topolov wants to be black here because even though black played g5 and h5 um, and his queenside pawn structure is compromised and he hasn't developed any of these pieces yet, so it's a very unusual kind of position, I think that's the aggressive potential that black has on the h file, on the a7 g1 diagonal. These are positions that Topolov and Wesley so are good at, and I think the position with white takes a computer to defend all the threats and get some of the positional advantages of, you know, this pawn structure that Black has that looks a little funny. Okay, bishop e2, Wesley played the move you guys at home would play, queen g5, defends the pawn, gets the queen over there. a5, which the computer says is probably the losing move. Um, I don't blame Topolov for playing a5. He wants to play rook a4 and get his rook in the game. Um, controlling f4 and g4 and the rook on a1 does nothing, um, but it's just too slow. f5, threatening f4, which I think would win immediately, so you have to take on Poisson. Knight takes, and now, uh, well, once black plays knight h5, I don't know what to tell you. Um, you resign. Uh, the f-pawn is pinned, so I don't know what you're going to do. Um, it's very hard to play bishop h2 when g3 is coming. If the bishop does move, like bishop h2, or, or take this pawn, I mean, g3 is just crushing because of this, you know. And, I, and I've seen this before. Again, I play bishop c5 in the Ruy Lopez. It's, it's a disaster for, for white. Okay, so rook a4, that's why he played a5. Rook f7 from Wesley. I would be more inclined to play king g7 and rook h8, but, I mean... You could play rook h7, which sort of accomplishes the same thing as rook h8. And I guess in some variations, if the bishop on c8 ever moves, we could double rooks and attack f2. So, and I guess from a purely pawn grabbing point of view, excuse me, um, the rook I'm trying to get okay, the rook on f7 defends the c7 pawn if white was interested in taking that. So, okay, rook f7. Um, rook e1 was played, and the idea behind rook e1 is to put something on f1, probably the knight, possibly the bishop, 
And the problem with rook e1 is it undefends the f2 pawn. But, okay, if he plays knight f1, then he's defending his bishop on g3, and so he can recapture with a knight if black plays knight h5, for example. Knight h5, bishop takes g4 was played. I guess he decided against knight f1. Um, if knight f1, I just take the bishop, um, and then I take on f2, for example. I guess taking either way wins, but it's probably wins quicker. Um, um, okay, so he played the move bishop takes g4, which sacrifices a piece. So Wesley took the piece, and Topolov immediately got his piece back by playing rook check, and bishop takes and rook takes c8. So material equality has been established. In fact, not only equality, but white took this pawn on g4, so white's actually up a pawn. Okay, now, but bishop takes f2 check was played, and... Again, both kings don't have pawns in front of them, per se, but black's king is perfectly safe, um, especially from these pieces. They're not anywhere near the black king, and the bishop on g4 on a white square is not attacking a king on a black square. However, black has lots and lots and lots of pieces that can attack the white king. So, so the game's actually over because of tactics. Um, a lot of moves win. Queen e5 is the best move. Wesley's really good at putting his opponent away. Now he's threatening discover check everywhere winning. Um, the cute variation, which you'll like at home, is if knight f3, which attacks the queen, we have a very we have a lot of moves that win, but we have a really nice win. So after knight f1 check, double check, I should say, um, king h3 allows queen g3 mate, so that's silly. And king h1 allows a beautiful checkmate. It's checkmate in two moves. So pause the video and try to find it at home. I'll wait. Okay, and you probably found queen h2 check and knight g3, which is a smothered mate. It's very nice. Okay, the players see that. So white didn't play knight f3. Although, man, I don't know what I would do. This position is tough over here because knight f1 is going to lead to mate. Okay, so he played king h3, getting out of this diagonal. And again, a lot of moves win, but Wesley played the best move, knight e2, which not only threatens queen g3 mate, um, if you make the obvious move to stop queen g3 mate, which is knight f1, then now you see why Wesley played knight e2, he plays knight g1 mate. And in these kinds of positions where you're calculating check and mate and discovered attack, there's nobody better than Wesley. He's an unbelievable calculator which we saw from the games of the U.S. Championship where he, in fact, all of the games where he beat Onishuk and Shabalov and especially Jeffrey Zhang, that he just, his calculation ability is unparalleled. Um, and when he gets positions where the computer says he's winning and he has to walk a tightrope, he, he walks the tightrope. So after 92, White resigned. It looks like he just got totally smashed. And you would think from knowing Topolov, um, you know, his career, that he would be black in such a position. So black didn't care about his queenside pawn structure too much. He just cared about his peace activity, and he cared about the white king, and he, he got to it. Um, and that's why he won London and why he's been playing so well lately. His calculation ability is really good. So that was one of my favorite Wesley games from last year, and I'm sure it was his favorite game from London, um, beating a very strong player with the black pieces. You don't get to do that too often. And pretty quickly, too. Um, wasn't a very long game, but it was a lot of attack. So uh, I hope you like that game and that you like uh, this channel and you can subscribe to my channel and follow me on Facebook and Twitter. Um, I'll see a lot of you guys at the Super Nationals next week. Um, I'll get there Thursday because my stepson's playing in the Bughouse tournament. We're going to leave about 5 a.m. because uh, the Bughouse starts at 11. Luckily, it's an hour earlier in uh, Nashville from Atlanta, so save an hour that way. Um, I think if we leave early enough, we can avoid traffic here. 5 a.m. is probably early enough to avoid a lot of the Atlanta traffic, and we're driving the right direction. So, um, so yeah, say hi to me sometime between Thursday and Sunday at the at the Super Nationals. I'll actually be at the chess.com booth, possibly chesskid.com. They're sort of the same company. Um, I guess it's Chess Kit is where I'm actually going to be working. I'll be there for four hours on Friday, Saturday, Sunday doing game analysis. So if you're playing in the Super Nationals, you want, my game, you want your game analyzed by me, you come to the booth. It's free. It's free, I tells you. And consider a donation at atlchessclub.com slash donate. 
visit our website. We have a lot of new stuff on it, and we're going to put more stuff on over the next month. I really want to thank our webmaster, Eric Rosen, for doing a great job, and I'll see you guys next time. Bye, everyone.